Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day two of UK Saudi Virtual FinTech Week. I'm Stilin Kouadri, and I'm the Department of International Trade's Head of Investment in Saudi Arabia, based in the British Embassy in Riyadh. Yesterday, we heard from uh, Saudi government stakeholders about the ambitions and progress of Saudi Vision 2030 and the key role that financial services and fintech will play. Today, we will turn our attention to uh, key Saudi businesses and, and stakeholders to get their perspective on opportunities and challenges uh, in the sector. Before we kick off our panel uh, discussion, I would like to invite Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for the Middle East, Simon Penny, to make a brief address. Simon, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Salim. And hopefully you can uh, see me uh, and hear me. But uh, I'm delighted to be here today on day two of the inaugural UK-Saudi Virtual Fintech Week. While the world grapples with the effects of COVID-19 on the economy, it's testaments to the strength of the Saudi-UK relationship and the appetite to continue to drive mutual trade and investment that we have launched this initiative. The GCC is already a key trading partner for the UK. In fact, if the GCC were a single export market, it would be the UK's second largest export market outside of Europe, second only to the United States of America. As the largest economy in the region that I cover as Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner, Saudi Arabia is a crucial and strategic partner to the United Kingdom. The Saudi economy is opening up, unleashing its potential and welcoming the world. From an investment perspective, and for our bilateral partnership, this is truly a very, very exciting time for all of us. Vision 2030 seeks to secure greater and sustainable prosperity through domestic and international investments. Vision 2030's three themes, a vibrant society, a thriving economy and an ambitious nation are underpinned by work in specific sectors. And this week, our focus is specifically on fintech. Our distinguished panel will discuss the opportunities in the exciting Saudi fintech space. As partners in this effort, the United Kingdom wants to support you in reaching your goals. We have plenty of experience. The UK's fintech industry is the, is the largest in Europe today, attracting almost 5 billion US dollars of investment in 2019 alone, across more than 350 deals. Our industry in the UK is over three times larger than that of Germany's, which comes second in the rankings. In fact, UK fintech investment in 2019 rose by nearly 40% to a new record, despite a year of, of political challenge and uncertainty. The strength of the UK fintech sector is derived from the commanding role of London as a global finance hub coupled with entrepreneurial tech talent, transparent policy and regulation, and a supportive and enabling government. But fintech uh, clusters thrive um, across the whole of the United Kingdom, in particular the cities of Birmingham, Norwich, Bristol, Cambridge, Leeds and Manchester are growing fintech hubs, which spread economic growth more widely across the whole of the United Kingdom. In fact, over 76,000 people work in the UK's fintech industry across more than 1,600 firms. These numbers are projected to grow to over 105,000 workers in 3,200 firms by 2030. The fintech industry is a significant and transformative sector for the United Kingdom, and it will be so for Saudi Arabia as well. Investment in both directions is absolutely fundamental. DIT is working with partners to drive investment into the kingdom. Inward missions, previously physical but increasingly virtual, are bringing investors and opportunities together in sectors from venture capital, tech and smart cities to education and energy. At the British Embassy, we will be holding similar virtual um, get-togethers like this across all of those sectors in the weeks and months ahead. UK companies are already making significant investments into Saudi Arabia. For example, Deloitte recently opened its digital centre, which will create more than 200 new jobs in fintech. Saudi Arabia is also a significant investor into the United Kingdom through the PIF SoftBank Vision Fund, 
which has invested over 10 billion US dollars into UK tech already, investing more than $1.8 billion into fintech with large investments in Oak North and Greensill, who we will be hearing from in the session on, on Thursday. By sharing expertise and championing fintech innovation and opportunities, I am confident that the kingdom to kingdom partnership will continue to flourish. I thank you for all being here virtually with us today. I thank our panel for contributing your time to make this week a success. And I'll now hand back over to Salim to kick off the next session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Simon, for setting the scene for, for day two. Um, and now, uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to our moderator for the session, Samir Gulati. Samir, over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, um, Salim, and also to Simon for those uh, for those opening remarks. Uh, my name is Samir Gulati. Um, I work here at uh, DIT uh, as one of the fintech specialists. And indeed, for those of you who aren't familiar with DIT, uh, we're the UK's international economic department. So we focus primarily on powering um, global trade and investment, uh, primarily through exports and FDI. But as, as you'll also know, we also focus on continuity agreements, trade agreements, free trade agreements, that sort of thing. Um, so again, welcome today. Thank you very much for, for dialing in. Um, today's session is on fintech opportunities and challenges in Saudi Arabia. So before I um, sort of introduce and, and move over to our panel, I thought I would um, uh, very simply summarize some of our objectives for today. So we, we've split today into three broad sessions um, and each is, is roughly 10 to 15 minutes long. The first session uh, or the first part of our session today will provide an overview of fintech and the FS landscape in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we'll then move on to help um, some of our attendees today uh, to provide some insight on the opportunities and challenges in the region. Uh, and then finally, we'll also look to touch upon the current investment and fundraising environment in Saudi as well. Uh, of course, throughout discussions, we will also keep in mind what role UK fintechs can play uh, in the growth and development of Saudi Arabia. I should also note that after each of those sections, so after about 10 to 15 minutes in, uh, we'll be taking questions from our audience today. So please use the question function on your dialog box uh, to send us questions throughout. Um, if you wouldn't mind letting us know who you are, where you're from, and also who those questions are addressed to, that would be incredibly helpful for us to be able to triage that to our panel. Um, and so without any further ado, I'd uh, like to turn over to our speakers uh, for a brief introduction and a background on your organization. So Jeremy, if you could turn on your, your webcam and, and, and go off mute as well, uh, perhaps we can start with you and you can give us a, a 30 second introduction um, to yourself. Thanks, Samir. Um, my name's Jeremy Searle. I've been in the Middle East for uh, over 15 years. Um, I've spent most of my career in telco. Um, until very recently, I was a uh, group uh, strategy officer for STC. STC is the biggest telco um, in the region by revenue and by number of customers and various other metrics. And like all other telcos, we've been diversifying away from core connectivity into other digital services uh, and have recently taken a fairly big bet in um, entering into the fintech sphere with SDC Pay, which I'll talk more about in, in a little while. Superb, thanks very much, Jeremy. And, and Yusuf, over to yourself. Hi, good afternoon all, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Yusuf Arugeda, I'm uh, Chief um, Digital Officer for SAP. Um, I come with 25 years of experience in technology and corporate banking. The Saudi British Bank, or SAB in short, uh, has an affiliation to HSBC. Uh, therefore, you can view SAB as a, a local bank with international flavor. Um, happy to be here uh, uh, with, the with the other gentlemen and colleagues. Thank Great, you. thanks very much, Yusuf. And Celeste, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Samir, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to DIT for having me here. I'm Dr. Celeste Turco. I'm one of the directors of the NEUM Investment Fund, that is the ESG VC arm of uh, NEUM, that is the biggest PIF giga project, that I have the honor and the pleasure to join 
more than one year ago. Uh, I'm an expert in the sovereign wealth fund, and I work with the Italian government in setting up our first uh, strategic sovereign wealth fund. I spent the past seven years in the region working for a large family office out of Dubai. Thank you again for having me here. Great to have you, Celeste. And Eva, to you. Is Samir? Samir, is that was that me that you? Wanted? That is you, yeah, Eva. Okay, I couldn't hear you. Broke up. Apologies. Uh, good okay. afternoon to everybody. Helenov, I work at Riyadh Capital. Riyadh Capital is an asset management firm, fully owned by Riyadh Bank. In a way, I would give a similar perspective to Yusef, uh, but slightly different because Riyadh Capital, among other funds, has a venture fund uh, called Riyadh Taknia Fund. And in Riyadh Taknia Fund, we have four fintech investments. So hopefully, I can add interesting perspective on fintech investment in the city. Very uh, delighted to be part of this panel. Lovely to have you. And finally, over to Mehdi, uh, if you could give us 30 seconds as well, that would be lovely. Sure, thank you, Samir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, apologies for the small technical issue I have, but you won't be able to see me today. Uh, so my name is Mehdi Ben Sliman. Uh, I'm looking after the uh, global expansion at Wahed Invest. Wahed Invest is the first global Sharia compliant robo advisor. Uh, the company was launched in 2017 out of the US. Following the, the success of our first launch uh, in, in, in America, we decided to open our operations uh, in London in 2018. And we are proud to uh, have been granted a license by the CMA, which is the first ever uh, granted uh, license for robot advisory in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. And it was last summer. Super. Thanks very much, Mehdi. So um, we've got our introductions out of the way. So I think what we'll do is move to our first um, sort of mini session of today's discussion. Uh, and again, quick reminder to anyone um, that is interested in asking questions, just use the question function on your dialogue box. It should be to the right of your screens. Uh, and if you let us know who you would like to answer your question, as well as um, who you are and where you're from, that would be great. So over to our first section, which is um, almost setting the scene in some respects, which is an overview of the Saudi fintech and FS landscape. Um, Youssef, perhaps first I'd like to bring you in, just to get a sense from your perspective of what are some of the key characteristics that you would define the Saudi fintech or, or FS ecosystem by? Okay. Um, before I answer your question, I'll, I'll, I'll do some background uh, about how well the digital itself is entrenched in uh, Saudi Arabia. So we are uh, a population of 32 million. Um, when it comes to digital, we are very entrenched. We have 44 million subscribers to mobile services, which is about 120% uh, more than the population itself. Uh, we, are, we have 30 million internet users. Uh, we have 23 million uh, active social media users. Uh, uh, in terms of penetration, smartphone penetration in the country is 86%. 88% uh, of the users are using the internet daily. So, it's a youth connected and very device savvy community. So when it comes to the financial sector itself, uh, the financial sector itself, it's, it's fairly advanced uh, in terms of offering product and customer experience. The latest of the offering, and I'm sure you, that you have heard this before from the regulator, is the a program known as the Instant Payment System, which is in short IPS. Um, this program is going to complement and interconnect the other building blocks of the financial sector together uh, into uh, a more uh, homogeneous kind of ecosystem, modern ecosystem that will open doors for bank, be it uh, traditional bank or new bank, as well as fintech. So uh, this is just a background about the financial sector and the uh, and the country itself. Um, when it comes to the Saudi fintech. Um, we are remain in, in, the, in a very infant stage currently when it comes to the overall uh, fintech um, 
uh, within the community itself. But I believe there is a bright future. Uh, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, the current trend within the Saudi market and even in the GCC, the other uh, uh, Gulf countries market, I've seen it in payment and uh, digital lending and ag aggregation and in um, uh, personal finance management. So this is uh, how I answer the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. And I think what I found interesting from what you said is there are 23 million uh, active social media users and I can imagine that even if I had a social media account I still wouldn't have very many followers uh, <coughs> in Saudi Arabia. Um, just to build on that that question then um, again we've seen fintech bring you know a great level of disruption for example to the UK banking industry a great deal of new opportunities the ability to better serve certain demographics to reach new customers in different ways uh, I'd be interested to expand that question um, to, to also ask you, where do you see the market moving over the next few years? For example, are you seeing certain trends shaping the future of, of the Saudi fintech and FS market? Okay, um, a bit again of a background. Um, there are a couple of important, uh, let's say, goals for the financial sector. I think the most two important uh, goals for the financial sector is financial inclusion and the cash and circulation uh, reduction through um, automation and digitalization. So over the years, we've seen, especially recently, we've seen um, um, a, a very, uh, let's say, a mega transformation program within the financial sector itself. Um, I think with the COVID, um, the pandemic itself, and after the early confusion, about the disease itself. Um, I'm witnessing those transformation program is intensifying, basically. Why? Because uh, uh, the importance of digital, importance of automation is becoming very uh, evident through, uh, through the pandemic itself. Now, um, again, there are lots of opportunity uh, within the market itself. Uh, the future trends, I believe, will be on data management and in mining, uh, uh, payments, uh, SME management, again, uh, the PFM, which is the personal finance management, social apps, and e-commerce e and wallet. These are the, perhaps the main, let's say, trends in the future. Very interesting. And, and Eva, I'd love to bring you in here. Are you bullish on certain sub-verticals? So, you know, exactly to the point that, that Yusuf just made their data management, payments, uh, personal financial management platforms, social apps. Are you seeing investment also go into those sub-verticals? I'd be interested to get your view from an investor perspective on the trends moving forward. Where are you looking to deploy capital? Yes, thank you. I mean, the trends are the same that uh, to, to those that we have seen in the West with uh, perhaps a few years delay, but I don't want to misrepresent and say that we are a decade behind because we're not. The financial system is uh, very well developed, very well regulated, banks are well capitalized, but we, for example, don't see as much digital payments. And I think the current COVID pandemic, for example, has pushed the, the, the digital payments to the next step, many malls, mandate a digital payment now instead of cash. Uh, I think we have to do a lot of work on digital payment over the internet, for example, as part of an e-commerce purchase. To have such a developed technologically speaking region and have 80% plus, I'm guessing now, but it could be as high as 90, cash on delivery for e-commerce transactions is unacceptable. And that just makes the whole e-commerce value proposition very, very clumsy. In addition, we have our colleague from Wahed, and uh, they have obviously done an amazing job building uh, Sharia compliant and not only robo-advisory products uh, that are marketed not just in this region, but also globally. Uh, we think robo-advisory and more broadly, saving and wealth management products that reside on the mobile phone is a very, very big trend. And in addition to payments, I would say I will single out those two trends as being 
the 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 the, the most uh, the, the trends that I'm mostly bullish on, and a third uh, distant one is uh, remittances through mobile. This is a region that has a very high proportion of uh, expat population, and I think people continue to pay anything between two to ten percent of the value, the principal value of the of the that is being remitted. And obviously, this is very, very ripe for dis disruption on mobile. Uh, we have more than 100% penetration of mobile, so we actually have the infrastructure that is needed to deliver all these changes. So in summary, I would say digital payments, anything to do with wealth management, and then remittances on mobile. This would be my first and foremost uh, category that I'm mostly bullish on. Very interesting, and, and and what I like especially is this this notion that perhaps in the UK, and and, and this is often said by commentators, fintech arose uh, like a phoenix from the ashes from the 2008 financial crisis. And what we may actually see is is whilst there are some unproven business models which fall by the wayside, there are some strengths within fintech which may continue to arise out of the current pandemic. And I really liked your uh, your three focuses there: one, digital payments; two, savings and wealth; and three, remittances through mobile. Uh, of course, reducing that that cost of remittances is huge, as yes. as I'm sure we all know. Um, you know, three times the value of overseas development aid goes through remittances globally. So it's a it's not an insignificant proportion of money. Um, I'd like to also now bring in Celeste. So Celeste, you know, again, broadening this question out, we often hear about the term embedded finance, this notion that fintech isn't just a thing in and of itself. It can also be a driver for the real economy. It underpins other subsectors. So it'd be wonderful to hear more about, you know, the pioneering work of NEOM and the investment fund. But also more specifically, how do you see fintech underpinning that wider project? How can fintech, for example, help to build out your particular fintech strategy through Neil. So yeah, I'd be I'd be really interested to hear those uh, those uh, comments from you, Celeste. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samir, for the question as well for the challenge to answer such a broad topic in a very few minutes, but I think the challenge will be very fast. So has uh, the speaker before me and yesterday panel uh, highlighted uh, fintech as a paramount uh, role uh, in the real economy and as well uh, Saudi Arabia uh, as uh, consider as the fast growing and big, biggest uh, fintech uh, ecosystem in the region and uh, for sure fintech has a very important role in the overall neo strategy as well we leverage the progress that we recorded uh, in the kingdom but allow me to talk briefly about neo in order then to dig in in which is our fintech strategy and uh, some of our investment targets as an iif so new as many of you know is the city of the future best practice for smart city or as we used to say connective uh, city is the biggest uh, giga project of pif both in terms of budget 500 billion dollars and land size the size of belgium in a location situated northwest of saudi arabia bordering Jordan and comprising really beautiful landscape. There is the Red Sea, the desert and the mountain. We foresee to have 1 million residents by 2030 and 5 million visitors, uh, plus global nomad. People who are not physically present in NEO, but virtually. And I think this is a very important point if you think of the services that we want to provide through our FinTech strategy. Um, Neom is, as you can imagine, is not just uh, a location, it's a vision, it's a mindset, it's a, an ecosystem that uh, we want to create, inviting the best talents and mindsets of the world to come. And that's why I'm pretty sure that among our audience, uh, UK fintech startup, there are those pioneers that will help us to uh, really implement our strategy. That what is it about? And I think some terms has already been used previously in this panel. Uh, the way we look at all our sector strategy, you know, is composed by 13 different sectors and fintech is a part of the service sectors that is directly under NIF is the idea of revisiting the traditional uh, uh, way of intending the sectors in an innovative, futuristic, as well as sustainable way. So for us, fintech is going to be a financial, inclusive, and cashless society. 
where we invite all the best cutting edge technologies and companies to create a fintech hub and ecosystem that can support the project to reinvent the future while you're living it. And that's why in terms of a specific uh, investment objective, we look at all those companies that can provide the new uh, with technologies for cashless and post COVID-19 uh, contactless payment that could be mobile payment, uh, it can be biometric payment. Uh, uh, but most importantly is we look at uh, digital ID, digital wallet, digital banking. As I said, we'll have residents, we'll have visitors, but we will have also global nomad. Of course, we look at the uh, sustainable data integration system and many other uh, potential innovative solutions for uh, e-commerce and other way of payments. Uh, I think it's very important to highlight the fact that the major driver of NIF and EOM itself in terms of assessing potential companies and I would say potential partners, that's what we're looking really for, is not only the inno innovative uh, and futuristic driver, but is also the sustainable one. And that's a very important element. That's why uh, NIF itself is an ESG VC fund. And I would like to conclude to say that when we look at partners, just because we don't want just to invest in companies, but we are happy when companies that choose NEOM as a place where they can uh, either manufacture their own technology, we have a NEOM uh, circular economic city, or be part of our fintech startups, where there's a unique ecosystem, not only for one sector, one vertical, but we have 13 different sectors that goes for energy, mobility, uh, sport, media, and communication. So we are very keen on having the most attractive uh, regulatory framework and the business support for all the pioneers that are listening to us and might want to help us to transform this vision into reality. Excellent. Re really helpful to get that sense. And, you know, absolutely incredible to hear about the scale of this project, you know, the size of Belgium, $500 billion, uh, I believe it was dollars that you said, and, and 1 million residents by, by 2030 is, is certainly not um, for the faint hearted, I suppose. Um, um, moving on and on to our sort of second topic, um, which it's, it's, it's great because it, it flows really nicely from what you were saying there. Um, Celeste is operating in the Saudi market, you know, really the core of today's discussion, the, the challenges and opportunities. And Jeremy, I wanted to bring you in on this particular question. Um, you briefly mentioned this, but I understand that that STC have been developing a fintech strategy. Uh, you've recently, as you mentioned, set up STC Pay. I wondered if you could just briefly elaborate a bit more on, on some of those strategies um, from STC. Yes, um, thanks very much. Um, it's interesting listening to, to Yusuf and Eva and Celeste, you know, you're, you're, and you're, you're clearly uh, the fintech experts. I'm a telco guy. I work for <clears throat> the biggest telco in, in the region. We have about 60% of the Saudi market. Um, and we figured, like other telcos, that going into fintech was a natural extension of, of what we can do. There's a lot of reasons we can help each other. We've got the data, we've got the data centers, We've got access to every segment in the market. We've got distribution. We understand the regulatory environment in Saudi. We've got financial support. And so that, that was why we thought we had an advantage. So we started STC Pay. It's 100% owned by us. We decided not to do it in partnership with, a, with an existing bank. We wanted it to be a new digital agile fintech. Um, and we built it as an app-based bespoke system. In retrospect, perhaps we should have partnered. Um, perhaps we should have gone and taken someone else's uh, stack and white labeled it, but we didn't. We built it ourselves, uh, and and it's 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 okay. It's robust uh, and it's safe. We operate under the regulatory authority sandbox. We've got uh, starters of the digital wallet. We've gone much bigger into payments now, um, and we're looking at going either into full banking, um, and then where do we stop? Do we go into wealth management? Do we go into insurance? Do we go into credit scoring? Do we go into mortgages? It, the, these, these are all questions for the future. At the moment, we're a payment platform, we're a digital wallet, we're QR based, but uh, that's, that's changing. We're looking for a full banking license, and like other fintechs, 
we've benefited enormously this year from from the virus so <clears throat> from relatively modest starts we've seen about a hundred percent increase uh, in our cash receipts uh, and disbursements we think that this year we'll take in nearly two billion dollars of cash in 2020 um, and that that was unexpected we're we're at 1.6 million customers active 180 days 1.2 million active 30 so we've got reasonably good uh, activity a lot of people have obviously have just come on the platform to try it out and and and, and left but many more have stayed in terms of the areas we're looking at developing product wise we're looking at uh, junior accounts for the under 18s we're looking at payroll we're looking at savings accounts but these are all quite minor and the strategic decisions that we have to make is where do we go next what do we do do we go into loans which is which is where the money is where would we do the loans do we do it using our access to data and credit scoring do we go into the mass market which are not as well served as the corporate market in Saudi Arabia and I guess that's the same in, in many markets however we're nervous about um, the, the amount of defaults we'll get just like everyone else so that's something that we'd be very willing to partner with people who have got much more expertise in using telco data and our ability to, to segment that data into credit scoring that's not something we've got experience in do we go into mortgages? We've got no experience in that. Do we go into insurance? That's a separate regulator. We provide some point of sales insurance for our customers when they buy handsets. Should we be doing that in a, in a, in a more uh, general way across the country rather than specifically a point of sale? Should that be something that we provide people that aren't our customers? Again, that, that's, that's a question that we're wrestling with at the moment. We're much more open now to partnering than we were perhaps before, simply because I think we've looked at other telcos and essentially we're infrastructure providers. We're not agile. We're not um, outside our outside our field. We're reasonably agile in telco, but in, in new services, this is not our DNA. We're trying and we're making a good go of it, but I think in specific products, specific lines of business, a partnering a partnering approach is something that we'd welcome and that's why we're, we're reaching out to to specialists fascinating and i think you know your your approach is is really interesting as you know an, you know an incumbent if you will that's looking to innovate and shape new markets i suppose i had a, a couple of immediate questions just off the back of that one was you know what what's your thinking behind going down this more regulated route of becoming almost, um, you know, getting a banking license, for example, versus continuing to operate within the space of telco. Um, very interested always to hear about the differences between mobile wallet providers um, uh, versus the need to move into a, a licensed, a more regulated field, such as providing, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, lending on deposits, for example, the typical activity of a bank. So, really interested to get your views on that um, uh, to begin with, Jeremy. Well, I'll start with regulation. I don't think that it frightens us. We we we're, we come from a heavy regulated environment, uh, and the people that um, work in STC Pay. Have, have generally come from the financial services sector, so they, they're, they're very comfortable with regulation. I have to say the regulation um, in, in Saudi, I think, is, is intelligent and it's, it's evolving the right way. It certainly takes um, a lot of notice about um, the players in the market uh, and they've got very open ears. It's not heavy handed at all. And so that, that gives us a lot, a lot of comfort that as Saudi goes through this enormous digital change, the regulators are listening and they're taking best practice from other, other regulators around the world. So I think it, in, in, the, in the regulated environment, we're comfortable. The regulators are, are, are very willing to learn and are very receptive to what, what players in the market are telling them. Um, and that's not always the case, as, as, as you know. Why are we doing it? It just is a natural extension uh, for us and there are so many crossovers that we can provide to our, our fintech uh, division. 
our challenge is knowing when to stop what 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 should we not go into what should we partner with what should we do ourselves how, how do we know where to go next this is not our core business the people we've got in stc pay are, are competent at this um but but telcos have made mistakes in fintech before they've tried to become uh, something that goes contrary to their dna uh, and that's that's what we've got to avoid um, that's really helpful. Um, what I'd like to do is also bring in Mehdi now as well. Um, and Mehdi, uh, one of the questions that I'd like to pose to you is we've kind of focused on the opportunities uh, we've seen, you know, working uh, from the perspective of a, of a you know, of a telco, um, the huge amount of work that's gone into STC pay, uh, 100% increase in cash receipts. Uh, we heard from Evo on uh, the potential future value of, of digital payments savings and wealth remittances i wanted to ask the flip question to you Mehdi. so um, when you reflect on the challenges more widely facing the industry in saudi the fs industry the fintech industry um, which verticals do you feel potentially have the toughest times ahead you know what more needs to be done to support those and again do you see opportunities for uk fintechs to be able to plug some of those gaps yes of course um i think uh, across the board uh, what what one thing that is missing is is a bit of automation uh let's say and when i say automation is basically uh, to allow some sort of open banking solutions uh, and develop apis uh, and this can only uh, be feasible uh, once you have the proper technology uh, infrastructure behind it uh, and and that means a lot of investments as well from the uh, banks themselves uh, to be able for all the you know new players uh, such as, as us right to operate smoothly in the kingdom um, from our discussion and from our analysis in, 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 in Saudi, um, it's proven to be a bit challenging sometimes uh, for us to implement the operations um, the way we would do in more mature markets, such as the UK. Uh, and then I can answer your second question is how can we see some opportunities for UK fintech? Uh, I think there is a lot of synergies. Um, there is a learning curve that's a bit uh, more advanced. Uh, in the UK, and I really believe that that uh, partnerships can can help uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, to keep growing and following, you know, like the steps of what has been done in in, uh, in the UK already. Uh, so I would I would dearly encourage uh, uh, fintech companies to to look at Saudi and and try to uh, uh, to find partnerships locally. Brilliant. Um one thing which has come in, um, and I think it's related to this. So uh, again, a, a really interesting question from our uh, from our attendees today, and it's a, it's a two-part question. One is um, is more widely, when should we expect uh, the likes of Saab, for example, Yusuf, to start adopting open banking standards and APIs? And interestingly, we've also got a question from Andrew Churchill, who's the author of the British Standard for Digital ID and Strong Customer Authentication. Uh, and this question um, is um, um, for, for you, Celeste, and it's to what extent has Neom looked at security standards for open banking? So the, the topic there is open banking. Yusuf, uh, to your side, firstly, on, on sort of APIs and, and your move towards open banking and Celeste, is this something that you're baking into, into the strategy for, for Neom? So, um, Yusuf, perhaps over to you first. Okay. Um, when it comes to open banking, um, this is, of course, this is uh, a regulatory kind of question, not uh, specifically to a bank. But I believe open banking is coming. Uh, is coming to the is coming to the to the to Saudi Arabia, and I believe the regulator have spoke about it before. They've uh, asked the bank their opinion about it. Uh, hence, I mean, uh, opportunity for companies like STC Pay. If it's uh, if this is really happening, um, but when it comes to API, um, um, the banks here are very open to that. Uh, I believe uh, all of us uh, in the banking industry have started uh, establishing uh, this platform as part of the engagement platform with fintech or third party. Um, so we are all there, we are, uh, technology wise, and we uh, continue to develop uh, onto that and uh, advance our uh, offering as well. Great, and Celeste, over to you. Um, is this something that you're bearing in mind, this whole idea of embedded finance and open banking uh, within NEOM? Uh, absolutely, and I think there was a mention of data security, if I'm not wrong in the question. And uh, I guess the data security, it's something that we look uh, through a holistic approach. 
because it's not just uh, fintech that require accountability and security in order to adopt something that is not just cashless payment, but we are talking about digital identity, digital wallet, and a cashless, 100% cashless society. And I would say that we move further than that because having what we call a cognitive city means that there's a constant exchange of data, not only related to your financial or fintech uh, application, but data on everything, on traffic, uh, on use of energy, on the use of water, and so on and so far. So that was our major and first concern, looking at the overall infrastructure and at ecosystem level of NEO, how we can be sure and assure our residents, global nomads and visitors that data security is our first priority and uh, any kind of uh, the application of the city in terms of virtual twin or fintech application, it's based on a very secure platform. And I think this is a very, very important point. Thank you for the question, because it allows us also to speak about the challenge that many times uh, fintech users have to leave traditional way of doing things for a new one. And it's not just the difficult of the change, but it's the trust. And I think that's very important. So thank you very much for this question. Thanks very much, Celeste. Um, Mehdi, um, quickly turning to you before we get to our, our last topic, because I know that will be of interest, and I'd, I'd like to bring Evo in on that on that last topic to begin with on, on investment and fundraising. But before we get to that, it's again very interesting to note that Wahed Invest are one of the only you know foreign fintechs to get a license in Saudi. I think you mentioned this at the top of our discussion. And briefly, for the benefit of our audience, could you talk us through your experience of getting regulated? So, you know, what are your plans for the Saudi market? And I also understand you've got big plans for the UK as well as one of your main hubs. So if you could tell us your role uh, or the role of the UK in, in your wider international strategy, but also, you know, some practical advice for firms that are maybe looking to get regulated in Saudi. Of course, um, thanks for this question. Um, Basically, uh, it, it's never easy to get regulated in, in any market around the world. It's always challenging. Uh, we would all love to uh, be able to copy and paste the models we have elsewhere, but you need to adapt and understand the local regulation. Uh, so it's taken for us a lot of uh, work on the ground. Um, I guess the whole process took about six months for us, which was quite fast uh, and, and comparable to what you would find in other markets. Um, so. Past the challenges uh, that I was mentioning, uh, I, I would, I would uh, mention that we've always received quite a strong support from the regulator. Uh, we've uh, uh, got the, the license from the CMA um, and, and basically it's always been uh, an open discussion since the beginning of the process, uh, which helped us to basically uh, uh, successfully obtain the license. Uh, we need to keep in mind as well that we need to be uh, understanding and proactive at the same time because we are uh, offering a new type of services. Uh, we are not necessarily fitting into existing regulations uh, and we need as well to uh, create some of the frameworks that we need to operate. So that means part of the, 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 the work we, we did um, and, and, and the CMA once again has always been very uh, responsive and, and open to uh, dialogue. Um, so, so they have created you know, a dedicated uh, uh, department that looks at fintech only and, and that's proven to be very efficient. Uh, Brilliant. For us, yeah. yeah, go ahead, please, please. Yeah, regarding the potential for Saudi, for us, it's, it's a very strategic market, one of our most strategic markets, uh, such as the UK, by the way. Uh, we want to uh, build in Saudi uh, what we are building already in the UK, which is a, a regional hub uh, to, to be able basically to develop the market locally because of uh, the population. Um, I, I guess we, we discussed figures before, but the, this is the biggest GCC uh, population, a very strong internet uh, penetration and, and a young population as well, uh, which is basically in line with the services we're offering. So that's one. Uh, we don't want to stop there. We want to use as well KSA uh, to service the neighboring countries, uh, namely uh, in the GCC. Um, so once again, that's the same idea we, we are building around our uh, UK hub. Uh, the UK and London is, is the uh, financial center of the world. Uh, for us, it made sense and it helped us as well in our growth, uh, you know, in terms of credibility, in terms of connectivity. Uh, and we want to keep growing, you know, the, our, our presence in the UK. Once again, under this local uh, angle where, where you have a local Muslim population that we are uh, willing to, uh, to serve, uh, but as well to use it as a platform uh, and, and uh, under different angles 
Uh, one of them is as well the launch of new products, um, and and we want to use uh, London because the reputability and 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 uh, basically the 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 way we can uh, distribute our products uh, labeled uh, under the uh, the UK framework is is very efficient for us. Uh, so we want to keep doing that. We we started launching our own family of ETFs. Uh, the first one was launched last summer, um, so that's already available, which is basically uh, tra tracking the performance of uh, large and mid caps in the US. We want to keep doing that and we want to use the platform uh, of, 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 of the UK to, uh, to do it. Fantastic. Um, as mentioned, moving on to sort of investment and fundraising. Um, Evo, uh, you know, fundraising is, is, is critical to startups across the board, you know, from seed to later stage. Um, so what does the environment look like in Saudi Arabia for a firm to attract capital? You know, uh, whether that's um, sovereign wealth fund, angel, high net worth individual, VC, uh, it'd be great to get, you know, a sense from, from, from your perspective as a Saudi venture fund, you know, what's Riyadh Capital's experience been of investing in fintech in Saudi and the wider region? Yes, I mean, we, Riyadh Capital mostly focuses on companies in the GCC, uh, fintechs in the GCC and I have to say it's not as straightforward to scale up from one GCC country to another for example it is not unnatural to invest in a UAE based company in Dubai or Abu Dhabi and bring it into Saudi conversely it's not an easy thing or a straightforward thing to invest in a Saudi fintech and bring that fintech to Kuwait uh, we keep talking about passporting rights, uh, whereby the regulator in one country will respect, will will basically have uh, governance across at least the rest of GCC, if not MENA, which is a much larger region. But unfortunately, that has not happened. So the fintechs are navigating, I would say, for now, still a pretty complex regulatory framework. But that framework is becoming easier and easier for two reasons countries recognize that they can the default answer cannot be no to any fintech disrupting the banks and increasingly the telecoms as well so the regulators are becoming nimbler faster much more sophisticated themselves there is also a very healthy competition between the regulators where we can, we can say the Saudi regulator is competing with the two UAE-based regulators who are themselves competing with the Omani and the Bahraini regulator. So that's actually a very healthy thing. And then lastly, very recently, in the last literally 12 to 24 months, we have seen situations where the regulators explicitly say to the fintech, start, we will monitor you and we'll let you know. The reason for that, and I see Jeremy and Celeste agreeing with me because they've touched probably most of the fintechs I'm referring to, the regulators don't have regulations for that particular vertical, but they recognize the importance of moving the industry forward. So especially in areas such as payments, remittances, and even cryptocurrency and exchanges, they are being advised, start, we will monitor you. And when we recognize an issue, we'll let you know. So it's very interesting to see that the license comes subsequent to the fintech actually already operating. In terms of your original question to, for fundraising, it is very difficult for the fintech to get a license. And I'm very happy for our colleagues at Wahed that got the license. But I think the operative word here is the first license. And that's actually quite troubling because we need to see hundreds, if not thousands more licenses. And I think the easiest way for a fintech, for a jurisdiction such as the UK, is to come through with a bank in hand. There are 11 licensed big commercial banks. It's a very competitive industry, including our corporate parent, Riyadh Bank, uh, or a telecom, because these are trusted, regulated entities uh, that eventually will probably become one entity. I think Jeremy touched on this very, very interesting point, and I just want to make sure that people understand it. I believe a telecom and a bank probably will in the future come together because they serve the same customer through the use of mobile phones. So there is no reason 
why those two entities will remain separate for a very long time. So I'm, I'm monitoring Jeremy and STC's successes in that area, but it's easier for a fintech from the UK to come with a bank. And then the bank might use that fintech's product and make it a digital product for Saudi Arabia that doesn't necessarily cripple the fintech, but at least it gives them a, a, an access to very affluent 35 million uh, Saudi population and possibly 60 million GCC population subsequent to the Saudi entry. Really interesting comments there and, and so much to unpick. We've got 10 minutes and I want to leave everyone the, the opportunity to also give a closing comment. So um, if you guys don't mind, we'll do a bit of rapid fire here. Uh, 10, 15 second responses would be um, would be great. Um, first question is to Mehdi. Uh, again, uh, you, uh, con con uh, congratulations. Uh, you know, you've recently closed, I saw on LinkedIn as well, uh, uh, an investment round which was led by Saudi Aramco Entrepreneurship Ventures, which is fantastic. Um, very quickly, could you give us your thoughts on what a founder can do to raise capital specifically during this period in, in Saudi Arabia or even internationally? Yes, um, I won't spend too much time, you know, discussing some, you know, general uh, comments, which are, you know, uh, just make sure that you, pro you you offer something that's scalable, uh, make sure that you don't have a, a too high uh, uh, cash burn and, and, and know your investor base, right? So you have a lot of different players in Saudi, uh, you have family offices, you have institutional uh, investors, uh, you have uh, governmental institutions. So uh, that these are the first things to keep in mind. Um, now, I think more precisely and, and more uh, uh, focused on Saudi Arabia, I think there is, there's is there been a switch uh, uh, these last few years uh, from the uh, a, a process that was uh, more uh, towards, uh, you know, foreign countries before uh, and which changed towards Saudi now. Uh, so basically the idea for um, fintech and, and, and people who, who are looking for investors uh, I would I would say to keep that in mind uh, that you know uh, bringing some added value to the kingdom is something that's very important. I think investors are very sensitive to that uh, nowadays, uh, which is great because uh, uh, that that's basically something that will uh, enable the country to develop uh, towards the vision 2030. Um, so I would say that that would be the main angle. Uh, make sure that basically you are providing something either by uh, setting. Uh, a footprint in, in in the kingdom or ma making sure that you are bringing some some uh, uh, some value superb uh, jeremy we've got a couple questions for you one that um is uh, a straight up stat question which is um specifically what volume of clients and transactions are you seeing on stc pay um so over to you first if you, if you have that data if not i can move to the second question directed to you I haven't got it right now. I mean, we've got we've got over one and a half million uh, active customers, um, and we're likely we're we're planning to take in two billion dollars this year in in cash receipts. Super. Um, I, I, in terms of transactions daily, I, I haven't got that to hand. No problem. The second question was uh, again on this theme of investment. This idea that. You know, raising external capital is, is one one form of exit. You know, another one could be partnership, you get M and A. Um, I would be really interested to get a sense from from your organisational point of view. And you briefly touched on this on the importance of driving innovation from within, which is what STC Pay is, uh, versus your strategy moving forward, as you mentioned, on areas where perhaps you don't have that comparative advantage of either acquiring or partnering with startups. So if I'm a UK fintech listening today, or I'm a fintech from anywhere in the world listening today, um, what should I be doing to, to get onto your radar? Right, that's a very, very good, very good point. So let me talk about funding first. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to, even before that, actually, I'll pick up on what Ivo said. Please look at Saudi Arabia as different to a proxy for the whole Middle East. If you want to go to the UEA, go to the UEA. If you want to come to Saudi, come to Saudi. But don't think that just by going to the UEA, you can jump straight into Saudi Arabia. It's, 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 it's like saying, I'm in the UK, I'm going to go to Morocco. Just because it's relatively close doesn't mean it's the same thing. Um, there are plenty of funds available for, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to say fintech investments because it's not necessarily startups. From us, corporately, we'd be looking at more C round. We, we're looking to partner with people that are big enough to partner with us. We're an enormous infrastructure company. Um, 
you know, if you're a startup with 20 people, we're probably not the natural investor for you. Our governance and, and, and the way we do things would be too painful. But you know that from from um, examples elsewhere in the world. So I'd suggest that you look at some pretty active VC investors in the kingdom. We've got one, a half billion dollar fund called STV, which uh, invests in, in tech in the kingdom uh, and outside the kingdom, but it's, it's, it's often in the kingdom. You've got Aramco that has multiple funds. You've got Neon and Celeste, you've got funds. So there are, there are a wealth of VC funds that are very focused on digital investment, absolutely open to, to tech investment and uh, fintech investment. And they would probably be able to do a smaller ticket size uh, than we could. Coupled with that, there are the possibilities of partnering with us in a, in a more um, product driven way maybe taking a piece. And that's something that <clears throat> I would really strongly recommend you to think about. Not only can we put equity in, if it's, a, if it's a joint venture, we can help smooth an awful lot of administrative and regulatory and logistical issues from getting people in, from helping you with protecting your IP, from um, all, all, all those issues that you have with coming to a market but what we ask is that it's not just uh, you selling us your products but a genuine JV with skin in the game on both sides and some of your people coming to the kingdom um, and that's the way we prefer to do it you, you bring us your your tech IP some people a little bit of cash and we'll will help massively with access to the market and so that's that's how how we can help. But I think you've got to work out what it is you're looking for. Are you looking for angel investment? Are you early stage? Are you A or B round? Are you C? Where are you? And then a trip to the kingdom once it opens up and you can in two weeks, sorry, not two weeks, two days, meet meet many of the key players, whether Brilliant. it's the venture capital funds, the early stage funds, the investments, private private money or indeed the big corporate investors. Superb. Thank you very much. And, and also very practical guidance. Appreciate we're coming up to the hour mark. So what I'll do is very quickly go to our speakers for literally one sentence, what you'd like to leave our attendees with in terms of your key takeaway. And then if you could also just let our attendees know what's the best way to reach out to you, um, you know, wherever that might be. So um, Celeste, <coughs> one quick line and, and how people can get in touch with you. Thank you, Samir. And let me be Naomians here. Uh, we always say, Naomi, you need to be bold to make it happen. So anticipate the needs of the fintech industry in 10 years from now on. Identify the niche. And actually, my suggestion is also, look how you can support the, the regulatory framework in terms of new uh, innovative solution for the regulatory framework in order to be faster and more effective. And uh, in anticipation of the needs, look also at the potential risk that uh, COVID just uh, show us that an interconnected, gamified, and globalized world can have. And of course, we're happy to be reached either by email or through EIT. And we are really looking forward to scout potential new technologies that can support new to become reality. Superb. And Evo, over to you. Same question. I mean, think very seriously about the value proposition to Saudi Arabia. It's the largest GCC market. It's a market that is becoming progressively more and more sophisticated with a very accommodating regulator. So it is very transparent to us in the last five, six years, we've seen opportunistic fintechs and also fintech funds, but we're talking about fintech companies at the moment. Don't be opportunistic because you will waste your time. But if you team up with, a, if you come, come up with a good story as to the value added, for this country and it was already mentioned by my fellow panelists and then if you team up with a bank including the bank that I represent you have a very very good chance to raise money and to have access to a market that very few people think about so uh, my contacts can be shared by you guys Samir and uh, my friends at the embassy I don't know how to disseminate them here, but uh, I would be delighted and I will work them through the list one by one and direct people accordingly. Superb. Um, uh, also want to bring in Mehdi. Mehdi, um, one very quick sentence and, and also how people can get in touch. Definitely. All right. Uh, so 
there are challenges, uh, but there is as well tremendous uh, will and support. I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, there is a huge potential for uh, uh, fintechs in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I would just encourage basically uh, everybody listening today uh, to learn a bit more about the ecosystem. Uh, and to come spend time and, 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 and basically engage with, with local players and, and regulators. Uh, for, for my contact details, same. I mean, I'm reachable uh, via email, so you're free to, to share my details with uh, anyone. And, and as well on LinkedIn, if it's more convenient for people, I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Brilliant. And Jeremy, over to you. Um, I think, I think uh, put away preconceptions you've got about investing in Saudi Arabia. Five years ago, it would have been a challenge to come into fintech, to find partners, to navigate the new regulations. Now it's so much easier. There is a real willingness to welcome foreign players into the kingdom, um, particularly if they're bringing things that benefit the kingdom uh, and address some social or, or commercial or structural need. Get in touch with us directly. Two years ago, we wouldn't have been able to work with you. Now we, we are. We've got a, a fully active um, VC, we've got a fully active corporate development team, and we're investing actively in this sector. If we can't, we could certainly point you in the right direction. Thirdly, think about partnering, even if you have to give away some equity. It's so much easier if you've got an equity relationship with a big player here, as Evo says, a bank, in my case, a telco, or, yeah. or someone that is used to operating in the kingdom. Um, it, one of the big family offices, another corporate. If you come yourselves, it's 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 possible, but it's harder. So yeah. so follow the route of least resistance uh, and open yourselves up for partnership. Excellent. And any way in particular people should should reach out to you? Email, and I'll just pass it on to the team. Brilliant, lovely. And I also want to give the opportunity to Yusuf. I know he's had a few technical issues, but Yusuf, if you can hear uh, any final parting remarks from you. Yes. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. I'm sorry for the uh, apology for the problem. Uh, I, I lost the, uh, the connectivity at our office. Um, Sam is very eager uh, to, to do partnership with, uh, with FinTechs, um, uh, especially partnership, because this is for us, it's the, uh, the way forward, it's the most appealing, let's say, way forward. Um, and uh, you can share my contact, uh, please, uh, to whoever is uh, interested. Um, there are lots of opportunity in the market, and I've said that before. Uh, but in particular, uh, the most, uh, perhaps the most challenging way forward will be on data. Um, data here, it's, uh, I see it in the foreseeing future, is, is going to be tremendously important, especially when it comes to the uh, uh, producing uh, products that effectively personalize the, the, the experience of the end user. So that's something which is not uh, very much there in the market, but I've seen it. It's, it's, it's going to be uh, huge in the, this market uh, going forward. And also in SME, SME in general, uh, be it scoring or something else. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Yusuf, for your, your parting remarks. And again, uh, apologies with, with three minutes over, but just wanted to give everyone the opportunity to leave you with some, some pearls of wisdom. Uh, again, a big thank you to everyone that's joined in. We had over 100 people dial in today, so a, a really fantastic uh, audience. And again, a big thank you to our, to our experts on the panel today. Again, getting your views on the ecosystem, how best to approach the market and the wider region, I think has been incredibly useful, not just for the UK fintechs that have dialed in, but I'm sure for the international stakeholders that have as well. Uh, and a quick final parting note from me to remind all of our attendees who are still on the line, um, to dial in for sessions on Thursday, um, so there'll be some more interesting sessions taking place. So with that, uh, a big thank you to my panelists and to the attendees. Uh, I wish you a, a good rest of your day uh, and look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Everybody. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Cool. Bye. Bye.